Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Sorry, we're a little bit late, uh, and we're going to get started here. So, first item is the Pledge of Allegiance, I believe. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to, and the, to Republic, the Republic for which it stands, which it stands one, one nation, nation under, God, under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for all. And justice for all. Okay, we're going to move on to the public comments portion of the meeting. Uh, I do believe we have a public comment tonight, just for future reference. If you would like to make a public comment at the board meeting, you need to email uh, Julie Norris, our district clerk, before 12 p.m. on the date of our next meeting. So now we will have the public comment read. There is one uh, public comment. It has come in from Jonathan Schaffer to Stephanie Court. First, I am disappointed that the superintendent asked us to call our congressman to ask for federal funding so that the governor will not cut school money by 20%. I am proud to say that it is not our responsib the responsibility of Florida, Texas, and Tennessee to pay for our lack of preparation and lack of rainy day funds here in New York. It is also not the responsibility of the superintendent to assume all parents agree with his political motivations. Personally, I think the school district could use a cut in spending by 20%. It is healthy to reduce taxes for the population. Please allow me to comment. Private companies in New York are suffering. They were already suffering when this pande pandemic happened. Private sector employees will lose their jobs, businesses, and homes. Most will see pay cuts lasting years. Many will not see raises for years to come. These are Hilton's Central School District homeowners, and there are many of us. Yet you have the audacity to raise taxes during this time. Shame on all of you for this. You should be voting for a flat budget, which increases our tax levy 0%, not 1.79% year after year. You should be voting to give relief to those in private industry who fund this district. I guess the public sector will make out like bandits, especially if they lose, if they get those big federal dollars. Meanwhile, comp companies were given two months liquidity, which will never make up for the loss in revenue during this pandemic. Will the superintendent with his $180,000 per year salary and his executive staff, which is not too far behind, give up some of their money to those without work? Will teachers decide to give back to the taxpayer their annual automatic and non-merit-based 3.9% pay increase through 2021? Will this board recognize harsh realities and stop pretending like this is a status quo year and finally reduce our taxes? Is school enrollment declining? Just curious. Unfortunately, I'm speaking to an empty chair. Here are some demands from myself and others in this community that have been discussed. Number one, a look at the website will name off plenty of administrative staff with roles and titles that spit on common sense. There is plenty of fat to trim. Please trim it. If not, I will vote no. Number two, a 401k retirement plan for all teachers and school staff with adequate match. If not, I will vote no. Anyone with a salary over $90,000 per year to include our superintendent, $180,000 per year, and his executive staff will take an immediate COVID-19 10% pay cut for 2021-22 and 23. Without that, I will vote no. Fuel reductions and no maintenance expenses by not using the buses and buildings for so long will be reflected in the budget as a taxpayer refund and will be reimbursed to homeowners on their next ta property tax bill in Hilton, the Hilton School District. With this, I will vote no. Without this, I will vote no. 
please do what is right for citizens, which will always be right for the students. NASA engineers who put men on the moon were educated in one room schoolhouses without Chromebooks. Let's think about that. Thank you, Grace. I don't believe we have any further public comments tonight. So we are gonna move on to uh, the recognition portion of our meeting where we're going to recognize the class of 2020 top academic scholars and IB diploma candidates. And I believe Dr. Green is here to help us with that. Hello, Board of Education. I am going to attempt to share my screen right now. Um, this is going to stop whoever is currently sharing the agenda, so just want to let you know that. Okay, so yes, uh, as Mr. Hilberger mentioned, I'm here to acknowledge our uh, class of 2020, our top 20 scholars of the class of 2020, as well as our International Baccalaureate Diploma Program candidates. I'm going to start off with our International Baccalaureate Diploma candidates. And I just thought I'd put in here a little bit of quote from a director of undergraduate admissions at MIT that speaks to uh, the power of the IB Diploma Program. Um, because of the way that it creates uh, intellectually curious and creative scholars. Uh, this year we have 10 uh, seniors that are uh, pursuing the IB diploma program and uh, they are Brendan Belair. Uh, his hobbies include working at Tim Hortons and spending free time creating art and uh, clothes and jewelry. His uh, school activities include being vice president of the GSA and the French Na National Honor Society and the Math League. Future plans include a attending SUNY Binghamton, and he wants to thank uh, parents and amazing teachers that supported along the way. An extra big thank you to Mr. Aykroyd for helping through all the years. Uh, next up is Jack DiPetetto. Uh, Jack is the host and creator of the Everything Geek podcast. He's a lifeguard at the Hilton Pool at Merton Williams, the Hast swim team captain, and he's also a volunteer swim instructor. He's a six-year varsity uh, athlete in swimming. He's a member of the National Honor Society and the treasurer. He is involved in the Spanish Honor Society and helped to create the senior video. His future plans, including uh, going to Ithaca College, my alma mater, congratulations, Jack. Uh, he'll be majoring in cinema and photography. And he'd like to thank his teachers who've helped along the way and his parents and family for helping uh, in never ending support. Next up is Emma Donahue. Emma's hobbies include being a lifeguard at Seabreeze, a volunteer at her church and babysitting her cousins and neighbors. She's the vice president of the marching band. She is the co-captain of the color guard. Uh, she's involved in the musical and does the hair and makeup for the drama club. Her future plans include going to William Smith College for a double major in inclusive elementary ed and English and possibly a minor in language studies. She would like to thank her family for pushing her and her teachers and administrators for helping her along the way. Next up is Sarah Engel. Her hobbies include being a cashier at JCPenney, a black belt at the Hilton Karate Center, playing guitar, piano, and drums. For uh, school activities, she's a class of 2020 treasurer. She's involved in mock trial, indoor and outdoor track and field, National Honor Society, French National Honor Society, uh, where she's the treasurer. She's involved in the newspaper club and tonal insanity. Uh, her future plans include going to the University of Albany for psychology, um, and then she wants to thank her family who's always there for her and supporting her and her teachers and coaches who have helped her through every stage of life. Next up is Ethan Jacob. Ethan's hobbies include water sports and tuning cars and photography and volunteering at the Open Door Mission. He's involved in the National Honor Society, Debate Club and Math League. He will be attending the University of Buffalo for a major in biochem and a minor in business and plan is to pursue a track that aligns with eventually going on to med school. He would like to thank parents, friends, teachers, and others who are essential in laying the foundation to build upon for the future. Samantha Pratt is another IB Diploma Program candidate. She is a crew member at the Hilton McDonald's, and she's a member of the Virtual International Scavenger Hunt. Uh, she's involved in the Hilton musicals and drama, the acapella, and a French National Honor Society member. She'll be attending Truman State University, majoring in psychology and minoring in music. She would like to thank her teachers and administration who never gave up on her, and her family who always supported her, and her best friend who's always been there. 
Emily Richardson. Her hobbies include dance, horseback riding, and horseback riding and babysitting. Her school activities include the French Club, International Club, Math League. She's the captain of the Masterminds, the Welcome Crew, the National Honor Society, and the French Honor Society. Her future plans include attending Boston University, majoring in biochemistry and molecular biology on the pre-medical track, and possibly binary in French. She would like to thank her teachers and her family for supporting her through every step of her high school journey. Next up is Adam Sheeler. Adam's hobbies include working at Wegmans and Starbucks, playing soccer and reading. For school, he's involved in varsity soccer, indoor track, tennis, model UN president, the school newspaper, National Honor Society president, student council treasurer, and math league. His future plans involve majoring in computer science at the University of Buffalo. He would like to thank his wonderful teachers for four great years, and especially Dr. Galp and uh, Mr. Ellicott. Uh, Samuel Thomas Wagner's hobbies include reading and writing, films, hiking, and other outdoor activities. At school, he's involved in cross-country track, debate club president, the Model UN, and the school newspaper. He will be studying entrepreneurship at the Whitman School of Management and Syracuse University. And he would like to thank his teachers, coaches, advisors, and family members who he continuously relies upon. Next is Cameron Weber. Cameron participates in theater, dance, and painting. She participates in all of the Hilton productions for the musical and the drama club, as well as a cappella and the vocal ensemble. She'll be uh, attending the University of Buffalo on a pre-med track and majoring in biomedical sciences. She would like to thank her supportive teachers and Mr. Ackley for keeping her on track throughout her high school studies and also for her family. That is the 10 uh, class members of the class of 2020 pursuing the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. And so now I'm going to move on to the top 20 scholars um, for the class overall. First up is Molly Ball. The, by the way, these are just in alphabetical order um, out of the top 20. So Molly Ball, her hobbies include working at JLU Child Care and volunteering at her church. School activities include National Honor Society. She's the secretary for the student body, involved in Sources of Strength, the musical, and the drama club. She'll be attending Cedarville University, majoring in global business, and she'd like to thank her family, her friends, and her teachers for always pushing her to do her best. Emily Bishop, hobbies include working at the Parma Public Library. She's involved in Drama Club, Masterminds, the Senior Video, and Tuesday Night Live. Future plans involve going to RIT to major in film production. She'd like to thank her mom, dad, Kevin, Holly, friends, and her teachers. Alexis Chatterton, hobbies include working out and reading and working at Abbott's Frozen Custard and the Coffee Corner. School activities include varsity soccer, varsity indoor and outdoor track, National Honor Society and Math League. She'll be attending Xavier University to major in nursing and would like to thank her family, her friends and her coaches for always supporting her and being there for her. Ethan DeGrandis, Ethan is the valedictorian of the class of 2020. His hobbies include playing hockey and hanging out with friends and works at Lakeshore Hockey Arena. He's the captain of the varsity ice hockey team. He's involved in National Honor Society, French Honor Society, Varsity Leadership Council, International Club, and the math. His future plans involve attending Case Western Reserve University and majoring in biomedical engineering on a pre-med track. He would like to thank his family and friends for supporting everything, his teachers for guiding in school, and his coaches for teaching skills and life lessons. Marina Dalvecchio works at Chick-fil-A. She's a coach at Victor's Gymnastics and also competes there. She is involved in the National Honor Society and the Spanish Honor Society, and she'll be attending Brockport to pursue a degree in computer science as well as competing on the gymnastics team. She would like to thank her family and friends and teachers and coaches for always supporting her. Jennifer Donatella works at Wegmans and as a respite, and she volunteers as a pre-K Sunday school teacher. She's involved in the National Honor Society, and she will also be attending RIT, and she will be in the Physician's Assistant Program. She would like to thank her family and friends and teachers for pushing her to always be the best version of herself. Zachary Fickner works at uh, Ridge Nickelback Recycling Center. He's involved in the Rochester Coalition Hockey Travel Team, and he's also a volunteer coach. He's the captain of the varsity ice hockey team. He's involved in National Honor Society, the Math League, the International Club, the French Honor Society, and the Varsity Leadership Council. 
You will also be attending Case Western Reserve University and majoring in biomedical engineering with a pre-med track. I'd like to thank um, his family as well as all the teachers for guidance along the way. Justin Gabriel enjoys staying active and exercising, watching hockey and soccer, and working at Deerfield Country Club. Activities at school include boys varsity soccer and the National Honor Society. He will be attending St. John Fisher, majoring in pharmaceutical chemistry, intending to pursue pharmacology. He would like to thank his parents and brother, friends and team, and all the teachers and coaches along the way. Skylar Garbowski is the salutatorian of the class of 2020. She works at Carbone's Pizzeria and Kit's Ice Cream and is a competitive dancer at La Dance Workshop. Um, she's the class of 2020 vice president, the National Honor Society member, math league, wind ensemble, and jazz ensemble. She'll be attending Roberts Wesleyan College and majoring in Homeland Security and Applied Intelligence, as well as participating in the Global Honors Program. She would like to thank her teachers, administrators for always pushing her to do her best, as well as her family and friends for supporting her. Ethan Hirohenko enjoys traveling across, working at Green Acres at the front porch and traveling. He's the captain of the track team, the National Honor Society member, Spanish Honor Society member, student council member, international club, a welcome crew, and on the boys lacrosse team. He will be going to Binghamton University to major in integrative neuroscience. He would like to thank his teachers for having a positive impact on this chapter of his life, and a special thanks to his friends. Haley Mayer is a competitive gymnast at Victor's and works at the Blue Ridge Grill. She's the secretary for the class of 2020, is a member of the National Honor Society, the Wind Ensemble, and the Jazz Ensemble. She'll be attending West Virginia University in the fall to major in criminology. And she would like to thank all the amazing teachers for supporting her throughout the years, as well as her family and friends. Owen Manley enjoys competitive hockey and lacrosse and volunteering to coach younger hockey players. He's a member of the National Honor Society, the Math League, the Varsity Ice Hockey, and Varsity Lacrosse teams. He'll be attending RIT to study software engineering and would like to thank his teachers from kindergarten all the way through senior year for all of the accomplishments that helped him at Hilton. Madeline Mason, her hobbies enjoy baking, hiking, weightlifting, and investing in the stock market. Uh, school activities include National Honor Society, French Honor Society, cross country, indoor and outdoor track, varsity athletic leadership council. She'll be going to SUNY Cortland to major in biology and then the chiropractic school at NYCC. She would like to thank her family and friends for their support and guidance and to her teachers and coaches for always challenging her. Melissa Polly enjoys uh, running at school and working at TOPS. School activities include being secretary of the National Honor Society, the French National Honor Society, wind ensemble, math league, cross country, indoor and outdoor track, and the Varsity Athletic Leadership Council. She'll be attending Syracuse University and would like to thank her family and friends and teachers and coaches for making Hilton so special. Brian Fung enjoys playing the piano and various percussion instruments. He is involved as the battery captain for the winter drumline and marching band. He's in the National Honor Society, the Jazz Ensemble, and the Wind Ensemble. He will be attending RIT and majoring in sonography. And to, he would like to thank his family supporting him over the years and to his teachers for encouraging him to always do better. Ruven Poplowski works at the YMCA as a lifeguard and sometimes works as a roofer. He enjoys serving God. His school activities include wrestling and he'll be going to SUNY Brockport or Roberts Wesleyan. He would like to thank God, his family, and friends for the amazing experience. Ana Rivera volunteers at her church, works at Carbone's Pizzeria, and co-hosts the Everything Geek podcast. She also plays the piano. Her school activities include the Newspaper Club, Senior Video, Vice President of Model UN, the Wind Ensemble, the National Honor Society, and the Spanish Honor Society. She'll be attending Niagara University to major in history. I would like to thank the teachers and the administrators who wore her Hawaiian shirt on that last day of school, March 13th, as well as her family who constantly supported her and all of her friends. Kayla Simone works at Jose Joe's and dances at La Dance Workshop. She is the senior class president. She's the president of Best Buddies. She's involved in student council, mock trial. She's on the principal's advisory council, National Honor Society, the school and the district improvement teams, unified basketball, and sources of strength. 
Her future plans include going to Cornell University to major in industrial and labor relations. And she would like to thank all of the Hilton staff and administration who have shaped her to be the amazing individual that she has become. Carly Sir, her hobbies include tennis uh, and piano. She is the student body president of student council. She's the vice president of the National Honor Society. She's on the principal's advisory council, Spanish Honor Society, and a varsity tennis captain. Her future plans include attending the University of Albany in the fall to major in chemistry. She would like to thank her family and friends for their continuous support and her teachers for always inspiring her. And Anna Wiza, her hobbies include playing tennis, dancing, and assistant teaching at Performance Plus Dance and working at Abbott's. Her school activities include student council, National Honor Society, and girls varsity tennis. She is going to be attending Gannon University to major in nursing and study pre-med and competing on the varsity dance team. She would like to thank her family and friends for always supporting her and her teachers for encouraging her education. So that is the 10 IB diploma program candidates as well as the top 20 scholars. And I just want to say to all of them, I hope they're all tuning in right now to the live stream. Uh, thank you so very much for being amazing young people, for being proud cadets, for being role models for all of our younger cadets for being just awesome people and stewards of our Hilton community and for your continued perseverance and determination during these most challenging of times. You just, you make me and you make everybody extremely proud. So I wanna wish you best of luck. And of course, don't forget that once a cadet, always a cadet. Thank you. Okay, uh, before we go any further, I just want to uh, want to thank uh, publicly thank Julie and Jeff for all the work they did to put that together, as well as the little parade that we did this afternoon to recognize those outstanding individuals. And thank you to Grace, who I'm sure is going to make an amazing Facebook post tomorrow. Uh, we appreciate everything you guys do to help us recognize these kids. Um, so moving on, next we have the budget hearing. And I will turn that over to Adam and Casey, I believe. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're just going to move into that presentation. Uh, as we migrate over, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Green for uh, putting together our parade. I want to thank members of the Board of Education for taking the time out of their day uh, to make those personal deliveries as well. Uh, it's great to get out uh, and see all those outstanding students and their accomplishments. Uh, thanks to Grace and Julie. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Ackroyd was able to join us as well, representing the uh, diploma program, and thank you to Dr. Suresh. Uh, so I'd like to start out uh, this evening, as we all know, uh, unprecedented times. Uh, we often talk about one budget cycle never being the same as another budget cycle, and that certainly is the case. Uh, so we have many, many challenges uh, as we move through the budget process, and we really want to outline the presentation and take you through some of the factors and hopefully answer the questions that the community might have about the approved spending plan. So the outline of the presentation is district accomplishments and data benchmarks. We've had an opportunity to uh, celebrate some of those with our students tonight with the top 20 and our IB diploma candidates. Also some of the budget factors. Uh, although we haven't been together physically, uh, business has been continuing on and the costs. And as we prepare to resubmit our reopening plan and the costs that it will take for us to reopen school uh, to our students and staff and do that in a safe way will truly be factors. We also have the 2021 proposed budget and uh, bus uh, purchase, the election of board members, and this year uh, something different than ever before is that it is an absentee vote only and those, vote, uh, those ballots have gone out to the community. Uh, so moving on to district accomplishments and benchmarks. Uh, so right there you see our award-winning drumline. Uh, they've done a fantastic job for the district year in and year out. Sometimes we might hear them during a board meeting, during one of their practices. I uh, also want to talk about the fact that we were once again recognized as a top workplace by the Democrat and Chronicle uh, for the seventh year in a row. And really what this boils down to is the outstanding staff uh, that we have uh, retained here in the district. They treat each other well, they work hard for children every day, and it continues to uh, earn us the recognition of top workplace. 
We've also had 70 teachers district-wide participate in assessment capable learning staff development. And one of the great things about our district is we're always on the cutting edge as far as training that uh, any of our staff members have the opportunity to participate. We've had several teachers again this year be recognized and nominated by families and students as Golden Apple Award winners. And at the seventh annual Empty Bowls, uh, which is, a, is the bowl is created by the students in art class and it's awareness about food insecurities, we were able to raise $1,300 for the cadet cupboard. Other dish, uh, district accomplishments include the fact that Merton Williams uh, raised more than $5,000 for the Ugandan Water Project. Uh, this is built into our IB curriculum and our service learning. So congratulations once again to the Merton Williams staff and students. Our PYP, MYP, and diploma program uh, successfully navigated the self-evaluation process. So not only were we self-evaluated, uh, but we also had schools from across the nation and across the world come to visit the implementation of IB. Uh, here in the Hilton Central School District. As I mentioned earlier, our drumline placed first place gold medal for the New York State Percussion Circuit Championship. And most recently, we went through 20 hours of threat assessment training to keep our students and staff safe with Mark Concordia, one of the leaders uh, in the area and the nation as far as evaluating uh, any types of threats that students or adults could possibly make, unfortunately. Also, we had a Section 5 Division I large team championship in cheerleading. Congratulations to our cheerleading team. Section 5 girls champion in the triple jump, long jump, 55 meters hurdles. New York State champion in a long jump. Uh, also second place in the hurdles, and that was an IID. So we'll be going on uh, to compete at the Division I level. We also have a Section 5 girls champion in the pole vault and second in New York State in a, only a 10th grader, Laura Regal, uh, looking for uh, future promise from her and her athletic career, also an outstanding student. We have a Section 5 Class A1 wrestling champions, four individual Section 5 champions, and five-time state champion, Greg Giacomahalas. Uh, so that should be a familiar name for not only the local, but the national and global wrestling network. Also, Section 5 Division One team champion in girls bowling. So I want to congratulate those teams, great athletes, but also great students as well. We also look at several uh, benchmarks uh, related to how our students are performing academically, uh, as well as how we stack up financially uh, in Monroe County. So the first uh, benchmark we look at are students earning Regents diplomas. As you can see, this uh, most recent data of 2018, we had 93% of our students earn that Regents Diploma. And over the 10 year history, you can see that we perform very well in the mid to upper 90s each year. We have also look at uh, the, those students that earn a Regents Diploma with advanced designation. You see we've had a nice uptick in that. This year it's at 63%. Uh, so those are really the students that are really pushing themselves to get that advanced designation. And again, over that 10 year period, we've had really solid numbers associated with that. So what do they do once they uh, earn that diploma? Well, 82% of the students uh, do decide to go on to either a two or four year college to continue their education. Uh, this year we have 61% uh, looking to go to a four year school and 21% going to a two year school. So you can see a nice uh, increase in those uh, going into the four year area, uh, up almost 10% from the year before. Uh, those that uh, are not going into college, because uh, we know the college isn't for everybody, uh, they're either entering the workforce, uh, going into a trade or technical school, or also going into the military. If we start looking at some of the financial measurements, uh, the first one we'll look at is the cost per pupil. The cost per pupil is simply our total budget divided by our total enrollment. The most recent data we have is from the 1920, our current fiscal year. And uh, for the 11th consecutive year, we have the lowest cost per pupil in Monroe County. Uh, our numbers comes in at around $18,777 per student. That's well below the county average of $23,003. There's several reasons for this. Uh, you know, one of the main reasons is uh, Hilton, we do believe, is a destination district. We're still growing. People want to move into the area. We think the school district is a big reason for that. 
And so uh, our enrollment has been very stable uh, over the time, where other districts have experienced uh, drops in enrollment, which obviously would impact their uh, cost per pupil. The other is really comes down to the way that we budget. Um, we do not generate a lot of fund balance from our budget. Uh, we're very frugal in that respect. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can just look at the different audits throughout New York State from the comptroller. Uh, there's many districts that uh, do get criticized for uh, having too much fund balance. Uh, we are definitely not uh, one of those districts and you'll see that as we continue on through the presentation. The other financial benchmark we look at are the county school taxes paid. Uh, over the last several years, we've typically um, fallen between you know, the third and seventh, so the bottom portion of the county. Uh, this year, uh, we are the sixth lowest in the county. You can see we're in a tight bunch there. You know, a couple uh, cents either way would have moved us um, you know, down uh, further. So uh, our average uh, homeowner based on $125,000 home would pay roughly $2,179 in school taxes. Again, that's below the county average of $2,294. If you go all the way to the far right, you can see those two that are pretty low. They kind of flip flop back and forth. Um, that's uh, usually Rush Henrietta or Webster. They have a much different tax base than us. Uh, they have, uh, if you think about Rush Henrietta, they have Marketplace Mall and car dealerships in every corner where we're very residential in nature. So we don't have a lot of that industry to help offset the tax burden. If you go all the way to the left of the graph, the highest in the county, uh, I won't say what district that is. However, they're very similar to us in fact that they are uh, very residential in nature. The only difference is they are fully developed. So they don't have a lot of new growth going on in their district. Um, so that's uh, what helps keep our taxes down here at Hilton. As Casey mentioned, there are a lot of budget factors. Uh, I always say that there's no two budgets that are ever the same. There's always some sort of curveball that's thrown our way uh, that makes it for a challenging budget year, and this year is certainly no different. We typically look at three areas uh, as we go through and develop our budget. Two of them are up on the screen here. The first one is the tax levy. Um, and uh, you know we look to continue to display our good financial health, uh, being respectful to the taxpayers, and providing a quality education to our students. Uh, so our proposed levy increase this year is just over 717000 or 1.79 percent. And I'll talk about that throughout the presentation um, and what went into those decisions. The next item is the appropriated fund balance and reserves. Uh, this is our savings that we're using in order to balance our budget. At this point in time, we're keeping that flat, uh, the same amount as it was this uh, last year. And our goal has always been to continue to wean ourselves off of the reliance on fund balance and reserves for balancing our budget. Um, obviously with the situation that we're in this year, uh, that is going to be very difficult to maintain and we'll touch on that uh, as we go as well. The last item uh, out of the three that we typically look at that I don't have up on the screen and you'll understand why in a minute is really funding for new initiatives. Um, over the last several years, we've really uh, looked at redeploying resources in order to fund those new initiatives. Uh, so that's something that we've worked really hard on uh, as a district, uh, taking a look at the various programs and initiatives that we had over the years. And uh, if we find something isn't working uh, or isn't up to where we would like it to be, uh, we would reallocate those resources and potentially add some uh, additional items. So uh, with everything that we're dealing with this year, unfortunately, we had a, a lot of great uh, new initiatives that were um, proposed by the administrative cabinet. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to, at this time, go forward with any initiatives. In fact, we'll be talking about reductions later on in the presentation. So when we're talking about the tax levy, uh, one of the things that is a major factor for us is the property tax cap. So this is often portrayed by the media as a 2% cap. It actually is the rate of inflation or 2%, whichever is less, plus or minus certain defined adjustments. And those certain defined adjustments, this is a very complex um, formula that we have to run through. There's about 20 different steps in order to calculate the tax cap. Uh, but the, base, uh, the basic uh, cap this year is 1.81%, uh, which is the rate of inflation, which is obviously less than the 2%. And you'll see that as we move into the next slide on each of the different components. So every year, the district must calculate their tax cap and report it to the New York State Office of the Comptroller. And every year the tax cap is different. 
and it's different for every uh, school district throughout the state. So if we look at Hilton's ta uh, property tax cap and the components that make it up for the 2021 year, we'll compare it to our current year of 1920. Uh, if we start right down at the bottom, the basic cap, it's outlined in yellow. You can see the first difference is our cap last year, uh, the rate of inflation was 2.13%. So again, that was capped at 2%. This year, we didn't hit that 2% mark, so it actually becomes the rate of inflation, which is 1.81%. That's the basic cap. That's often what you hear uh, from the media. A lot of the, or some of the major things that go into our cap number, uh, moving up is the uh, items in green. That is a new construction. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we believe that Hilton is still growing. Uh, we believe that families want to move uh, to this area. We think that a big reason for them wanting to move this area is because of the school district uh, and all of the great uh, programs and accomplishments uh, that you heard earlier in the presentation. So we've been pretty consistent over the years in this number. Uh, it was actually a, a down a little bit last year, so it was nice to see a little bit of a rebound this year. Um, and we can add 1.23% to our cap for this year. What's in purple, um, which you can clearly see in the 1920 cap, uh, is related to the changes in our capital tax levy. So this is uh, our capital projects, the debt service and the building aid that we receive on that, as well as our bus purchases and the transportation aid that we receive on there. And a new change in the law this year uh, was the exclusion of the BOCES capital construction because we're part of the Monroe II BOCES. Uh, so last year, we were able to add to our cap uh, about 1.14%. This year, we actually had a decrease in the cap of 1.25%. So uh, our cap this year is 1.79%, which is actually less than the basic cap because of those other defined changes uh, that we went through. So as you can see, the property tax cap can change uh, pretty dramatically over the years. Uh, last year, our cap was 387 and we actually went out at a 3.49. This year, our cap is at 1.79, and we're proposing a 1.79 uh, increase uh, in the tax levy associated with that. That is not um, what the taxes will increase, and I'll talk about the taxes later on in the presentation. Other budget factors include retirements. Uh, this year, we have 21 uh, retirements currently. We have nine teachers, 11 support staff, and one administrator. And anytime a position becomes vacant, we look at that position. We determine if we're going to replace that position uh, as is, if we're going to eliminate, eliminate that position altogether, or if we're going to change or modify the position to meet our current needs. So uh, as we move through and how this impacts the budget is we're often replacing a higher paid uh, senior level uh, teachers, support staff, administrators with entry level um, replacements. So uh, there is a budget savings associated with that. The other big factor uh, for us is what we receive from the state. So the settlement of the state budget, uh, in particular this year was a very difficult year um, with everything that was going on statewide and then really in the, uh, in the country and in the world. Uh, so that has kind of trickled down and impacted our overall state aid that we receive. The largest, most uh, unrestricted portion of that state aid is our foundation aid, and that's coming in flat. We typically use that foundation aid to help offset, you know, increases in, in contracts or, or funding those new initiatives or reducing our reliance on fund balance or being able to come in under our property tax cap. So with that aid being flat, that uh, obviously was a major budget factor in developing this year's budget. With that said, we also saw a pretty significant increase in our building aid. Uh, this is an expense-driven aid. It's really related to our capital projects. Um, and if you've been following the budget over the last several years, um, and I'll have a slide on this later, uh, it's really all a matter of timing as far as um, why we received the increase or we're projecting to receive that increase in this budget year. Um, so I'll have some more information to discuss about that throughout the presentation. And then the last big expense side, uh, you know, driver to our budget is our health insurance. Now we are fortunate because we do participate and are part of a consortium with other districts in Monroe County. So that has helped to keep our uh, rate increase lower than what the community rate increase would be. It's still about an 8% increase and I'll show how that impacts our budget later on when we get to the actual numbers. One of the other things that we've been uh, really conscious about in, in promoting and educating our employees on 
is the move to a high deductible health plan. Uh, we have over 140 uh, individuals throughout the district that have uh, decided to move to a high deductible plan, hopefully both saving them money and the district as well. Um, we are one of the um, you know, more districts that have more participation in that plan uh, in the county than several other districts. So uh, we continue to educate our employees and if it uh, makes sense, then they move to uh, those uh, health plans. And then really, uh, this is something that I felt um, needed a slide of its own. Uh, we're obviously all dealing with uh, COVID-19. Um, it's really impacted all aspects of our life and it has impacted uh, our school district as well uh, as far as our budget development process. So um, we're looking at this and we're taking a multi-year approach uh, in order to do this. And um, we're kind of using the 2008 financial crisis as kind of the blueprint on what we think may happen. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that more uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, but we are looking at this as a multi-year approach uh, that we're going to have to overcome to continue to balance our budgets and provide the programs and services that the community has come to expect. Uh, in the short term, we've done things like cut off purchasing. Uh, we're trying to do everything we can to maximize our fund balance for this year so that we could take that savings uh, and potentially help offset uh, some revenue reductions that we may see in the future. Uh, we've looked at reductions to staffing and programs for the 2020-21 year. Uh, which we'll go over those uh, later on in the presentation. And we also looked at reducing really all other areas of the budget. Nothing was uh, left unturned as we developed this year's budget. In the long term, uh, we are also looking at reductions to staffing and programs if needed for future years, but we're hoping that we can do that through attrition and not have to have massive layoffs. We're also hoping that um, our fund balance, our rainy day fund, our savings account, so to speak, uh, will be able to be utilized in order to help uh, balance our budget as we move forward. So as we were going through, uh, one of our goals was to build a budget uh, that gave us the most financial flexibility that we can. Again, because we knew that this was going to be a multi-year um, issue, we wanted to make certain that uh, we were not only looking at the 2021 year, but also looking several years out um, as we you know, continue to look long-term financially as a district. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the increases that we're seeing related to uh, our increase in state aid is related to our capital projects. And COVID-19 has also impacted our projects. Uh, first, it happened negatively where we shut everything down, uh, and then we were able to bring back essential workers like construction and continue some of the work uh, in our district. So uh, we had originally proposed three different scenarios uh, in some past budget presentations. Uh, at board meetings in um, April and May. Uh, really, we had a scenario one, which was a high risk scenario, meaning that all of our work would be done uh, by a certain time. We had scenario two, which was kind of a medium risk where some of our work would be done uh, by this summer and some of it would be extended throughout the rest of this calendar year. And we had scenario three, uh, which was the lowest risk, uh, which would mean all of our work would be delayed until after this calendar year. So. We ultimately settled on scenario two, uh, which did bring down our property tax cap slightly, and, uh, but it also uh, provided us with some additional state aid, which I'll talk about as we continue through the presentation. So this, uh, I always like to give a capital project update during our budget presentations. Um, so this is uh, um, a picture uh, of our village elementary school. We had some classroom renovations and this is some of the new learning space that is available uh, that we're continuing to look to do throughout our capital projects and all of our buildings. Uh, so back in December of 2016, the community passed a 32 and a quarter million dollar capital project. Uh, we had this as a phased project. So we had a successful bid opening for the final phase, which is phase 2B. Uh, that took place in September of 2019. We had a lot of great contractors bidding on our project. Uh, we had a lot of very um, aggressive bids, so we were able to, um, uh, you know, save additional money because of the climate when we went out to bid. Phase one of the project uh, was a, a new roof and mechanical systems at the high school and also the relocation of our tennis courts. 
Uh, we have experienced some issues with our tennis courts and we're working with the vendor on a solution to um, correct that. Uh, so that uh, is not finalized yet. Um, the work is done, but we're now uh, working through some issues uh, in the warranty stages of that. Phase two of the project uh, took place at Village Quest and Merton Williams. Uh, that is projected to be completed by uh, the spring of 2020. We have some minor work that we're still uh, completing um, to finish that up, but we're very close to having that work um, complete. And then phase 2B, we just got underway um, right around the April break time period. We're anticipating that this will be complete by the spring of 2021. Uh, we're hoping that it will be done by the end of this calendar year. That could accelerate some additional state aid our way. Um, and with the, our current shutdown, we have been able to make um, some very good progress. If you've driven by the high school, you've seen the renovation work that's taken place, uh, including the bus loop out front. Uh, we are working with Monroe County Department of Transportation. There will be a traffic signal uh, that will be out in front of the high school. I think that's been something we've been working on for several years and it's finally coming to fruition there. And we're also doing some work over at Northwood um, we're doing main uh, entrance improvements at both Northwood and the high school. And then lastly, at the high school, we are doing some renovation work to the science classroom. So we have a lot going on in the area of capital construction, and that obviously plays a role in the development of our budget. So this is kind of the first look at our budget. We, we broke down, you know, over 800 individual lines of budget into kind of the major categories. And if we jump right down to the bottom, uh, you can see that our, our proposed budget for 2020-2021 is $84,467,153. That's up about 3.5 million or 4.42%. But again, if you remember, and if you've been following the budget over years, last year we actually had about a million and a half budget decrease from the year before. That was related to the timing of that capital project. Um, so we knew that we were gonna see a bigger increase this year due to uh, the passing and, and the funding uh, the permanent financing of the capital project. I'm not going to go through every one of these lines, but I will point out uh, a couple. So the benefits statutory line, that is really um, driven by the New York State Teachers Retirement System and the Employees Retirement System. Both of those rates of increase, uh, the Teachers Retirement System rate went from 8.86 to 9.53, and the Employees Retirement System rate went from 15.8 to 16.1%. Uh, so those uh, are the driving factors behind that increase. The benefits contractual, I touched on this earlier related to health insurance. That's really the driving force behind this uh, at almost an 8% increase this year. Uh, that's uh, looking like that it's going to be just over a million dollar increase to our budget uh, with health insurance. And then debt service is the one that should really be jumping off the screen. That's up 20%. It's uh, just over uh, a million dollar increase. And that again is related to the permanent financing related to the capital projects. Uh, and that was anticipated. We expected that to go up. And you'll see when we talk about the revenue side, uh, what that costs for us as far as increases in our building aid. So just wanted to show um, a different way to look at it, a new, kind of a new breakdown um, to look at. So I'm comparing the 1920 budget to the 2021 budget and breaking it down into kind of the three large categories. So we have the administrative category, the capital category, and the program category. You can obviously see the bulk of our budget goes to the program side of things. We're very, very uh, similar from year to year uh, as we go through this. So just another graphical way to look at our budget um, so you could see how the different areas kind of impact the overall budget. All right, moving on to frameworks for success. So uh, within a matter of about a week, we took an $83 million business and made it completely remote. Uh, not only did we do that, but we're proud to also say that we've moved forward uh, with our strategic goals. Uh, we may be slowing down a bit uh, because many of these are linked to uh, economics, but we know that we're gonna continue uh, to move forward uh, with the important work that we need to on behalf of our students as we also reinvent or reopen uh, school in a, in a different environment. So things are gonna look different. We're gonna continue to push on these, but we also understand that we may uh, be shifting into some different gears, carrying out the uh, strategic goals of the district. So I do wanna share with you the focuses uh, for the 2021 year. 
uh, teaching and learning, uh, we've been successful increasing the student pathways to graduation, uh, just as we celebrated today the top 20, but all the seniors, uh, you can truly see some of the great uh, paths that they've taken uh, to not only uh, secondary education, uh, post-secondary education, but also into career and trades in the military. So we're very proud of the fact that we're putting uh, top-notch graduates out there and the graduates themselves are working hard uh, to create those different pathways to graduation. Uh, we've also been focused on work uh, creating more opportunities for students to develop skills in order to meet the need of the current workforce market. Uh, so it doesn't make sense for us to prepare students for jobs that aren't there. Uh, so we've definitely continued to grow in the area of providing them the skills they need, some for careers that we don't even know exist. Uh, so we've been very successful. I want to thank the Office of Instruction and our teachers uh, and our building administration for the work done there as well. Uh, under people in the strategic plan, a focus area three, address and meet social emotional needs of our students. Uh, so we've done some very heavy lifting here. Uh, certainly all we need to do is uh, turn on the news and we can see uh, working through the COVID crisis, the fact for continued support and growth and nourishment of social emotional needs, not only of our students, but also of our staff. And also with the uh, social injustice uh, that's being uh, experienced uh, more than ever, uh, continuing to work on supporting our students and really working through uh, what equity means for our uh, greater learning community and for our students. So making sure that uh, no matter your race, your religious belief, uh, your sexual identification, uh, gender identification, uh, that you feel welcomed and we are equitable in the education that we provide to you because all students have that right uh, to that education here in the Hilton Central School District. Uh, so we've done some good work there. We have more work to do, of course. I think any school district will tell you that. Uh, when we move into goal five, develop and support next steps to increase positive school culture and climate. Well, we feel pretty good about that. We've uh, been able to include thought exchange, which gives a voice to many of our stakeholder groups. Uh, we've recently utilized that uh, through the uh, recruitment process for uh, Merton Williams principal. Uh, we haven't finalized that yet, but we've received that feedback. Those thought exchanges have also been shared with the community and also uh, the staff as far as uh, what we need to do to reopen school uh, once we get the green light uh, from the state government. Uh, so we continue to uh, provide those opportunities. Communication is often given as feedback and how we can improve a positive culture and climate and clearly linking back to the top workplace recognition. We can see we've made progress there. And then strength and community partnerships, continuing to work in that area to make sure that the community uh, feels one with the school district. We've been able to do that with some of our internships and also through the use of thought exchange and making some of the decisions uh, in the budget process. And then under systems, strengthening program evaluation systems. Uh, we need to continue to grow here. This isn't probably uh, a goal that we've made uh, substantial growth in. Uh, but we, re, we have restructured uh, our administrative unit to include Dr. Miller, who is overseeing the evaluation system. And then also, uh, Ms. Zubeda will be playing a role there. And this plays a role as we work on uh, being a most efficient and effective uh, with our budget and, and the money that the uh, taxpayers provide us uh, to provide instruction. So we continue to grow in that area. And we continue to implement systematic data-driven approaches. So the decisions we make and the systems we have in place are, place, are based on science, are based on social science research, um, and continuing that work there to make sure that's systematic and uh, data-driven. As far as budget reductions go, uh, as Adam mentioned earlier in the presentation, each time uh, someone leaves the uh, learning community, whether it's through retirement or they leave to go to another district or job opportunity, uh, we always evaluate that. So uh, we've had some good success in the administrative realms of restructuring. Uh, so if you remember, uh, some of you may not, uh, Dr. Thayer, Dr. Thayer retired several years ago. We were able to uh, restructure in that area of the administration. Uh, most recently, uh, we lost Dr. Zaffitz to the Greece Central School District, and we restructured the technology department there. And most recently, uh, we had a data administrative uh, opening, and we were able to marry that with another position in need for the district. Uh, so although there's not an administrative reduction in this proposed plan, uh, over the last 24 to 36 months, uh, we've been strategic 
And when you compare the number of administrators in the Hilton Central School District with other school di districts in Monroe County of our size, uh, we have uh, some of the fewest numbers as far as uh, central office and district-wide administration. Also moving through the staffing reductions, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we were able to uh, make some of these reductions through attrition. We always wanna keep the reductions as far away from children as possible. But with that being said, uh, we know unfortunately that this isn't a positive budget for keeping everything away from students. Unfortunately, we have had to make some reductions to staffing. So you can see the certified staff through attrition, you have 5.2, a uh, layoff of 1.1. Uh, others, we have 1.9 for a total of 8.2. For classified staff, which would be uh, more of your school-related personnel, we have uh, a 1.0 through attrition, 2.0 layoff, 1.0 other for a total of four. And that gives you a total in this recommended proposal of 12.2 reduction of staff. So we've done, like I said, we've done everything that we can to keep it away uh, from the classroom, but we do know that this will most likely have somewhat of a negative impact on our overall operations. Uh, we've also addressed supplies, conferences, field trips, and district-wide initiatives. So as we do uh, look to move forward with the strategic plan, we know that many of those great initiatives that were brought forward through some of our Shark Tank meetings uh, will not be able to be supported due to this budget, and we will be limiting uh, conferences and supplies as well. So as we move to our uh, revenue budget, the first thing I'd like to point out is that our revenue and expenditure budget equal. Uh, so you see that same $84,467,153 budget. Um, I'm not going to go over every single one of these lines, but just to point out a couple, um, the state aid is up $2.8 million. Uh, most of that is related to the capital project. Uh, as our foundation aid did come in flat. However, uh, we did have um, some projected aid coming in for uh, the capital project. The property taxes, which is the other large category revenue source for our budget, uh, that's that the 1.79%, which is at the property tax cap maximum, that will increase the levy by just over $717,000. If you look at the reserves and appropriate fund balance, uh, no changes there. We did have a little bit of a change in the mix between some of the reserves, but overall it stayed flat between those categories. The last thing I'll point out is the sales tax. Sales tax is something that we're keeping our eye on uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, because we're seeing businesses shut down and people uh, not spending as much money as they have in the past. Uh, we are making sure and looking at uh, that. So there is some risk associated with that. There's actually some risk associated with our state aid as well. Um, in the settled state budget, there are three revenue reduction assessment periods where the state can come back to local municipalities, including school districts, and uh, make a reduction to their budget in the middle of the year. That doesn't give us a lot of time to react uh, to that. However, that is why we're trying to be as flexible as possible, take that multi-year approach, and be able to utilize the fund balance that we're trying to maximize in order to get us through any of those reductions without having to have additional uh, layoffs. So um, there is risk associated with that. Uh, the other risk regarding state aid uh, is in the area of transportation. Uh, if we do not spend the same dollar amount as we have in the past or what we projected, uh, then we're not going to receive as much aid. So with the shutdown and the buses not, um, you know, being uh, on regular routes and being idle, uh, we have the potential of spending less, therefore receiving less aid, uh, but it also does provide additional fund balance for this year, again, uh, hoping that we can weather the storm with that. And then lastly, which uh, isn't necessarily here, and this is more on the politics side of things, uh, you know, the governor of New York is really pushing to have a federal stimulus package. If that federal stimulus package comes through and it does support uh, local municipalities, including school districts, um, as he's is suggesting that we need, um, then we could um, see the potential of having an additional revenue source come in related to that. So uh, if that uh, does come in, that's going to be great news for us as a district and school districts across the state, um, as they will hopefully be able to avoid layoffs. The downside to that is once that federal stimulus money goes away, if the state hasn't recovered financially, uh, then we're going to basically just be delaying 
um, you know, the reduction. So that's something that we're also keeping an eye on uh, as we develop our budget. So this is kind of the history of our appropriate fund balance and reserves and how we use uh, those funds in order to balance our budget. And this is really acting as the roadmap uh, for what we're going through right now. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this slide. Uh, the red on the slide represents uh, our fund balance that we're using to balance the budget and the blue represents our reserves that we're using to balance the budget. So the combination of those two, you can see back in 2008-9, uh, we had a very small amount that we needed to balance our budget. We then had the banking collapse, financial market collapse uh, in 2008. Really didn't have too much of an impact on our next year's budget, a 2009-10 budget. We had a slight increase uh, in what we used in our fund balance reserves to balance our budget. We didn't have any major layoffs or uh, reductions to programs, supplies, conferences, et cetera. Uh, but then it really hit us in the 10-11 year. And you could see that what we had to dip into on our savings side really increased. Uh, we did have some federal aid that helped offset that, but we had millions of dollars worth of cuts uh, that we had to go through in order to balance our budget. Then you see the next year, 11-12, that kind of spiked up again. Uh, that was because the federal stimulus money um, then disappeared. Uh, so the state wasn't prepared uh, financially to be able to uh, backfill that for districts. So we again had to uh, tap into our savings about another $500,000 in order to balance our budget. And then once and, and as the economy began to improve, uh, we were able to again meet that goal of weaning ourselves off of using our fund balance. We've had a nice downward uh, trajectory uh, since that point in time. We've kind of leveled off a little bit here, but we're anticipating something very similar to take place due to the COVID-19. So uh, if we look at that, um, you know, we could have probably balanced our budget this year without too much um, impact. However, we looked at it as an opportunity to kind of analyze those positions, make those reductions as was discussed earlier in the presentation, uh, to set us up to hopefully weather this for the long term. Uh, we are looking to build our fund balance. If we solely use our fund balance only to balance this budget, uh, we would anticipate on um, being able to do that if we followed the same model in 2008, uh, we would run out of fund balance in about three to four years at max. So we know that this is going to be a multifaceted approach over the uh, next several years in order to balance our budgets. All right, so now uh, what a lot of you are interested in is what is this going to do to our tax rates? So um, even with a 1.79% uh, increase in the tax levy, uh, we are still projecting a tax rate decrease. Uh, so uh, if we look at uh, the four towns that make up our district, uh, in 1920, uh, both Clarkson, Greece, and Parma were all at 100% equalization rate. Uh, and the tax rate was $22.94 per thousand dollars of assessed value. Hamlin was at 93% equalization rate, so their tax rate was a little bit higher at $24.67 per thousand dollars of assessed value. As we are working with the uh, town assessors at each of these towns, uh, looking at what the changes are, projected changes for tax assessments and for the equalization rate, uh, that's what brings us to the projected 2020-21 uh, numbers. So for this upcoming year, both Clarkson and Greece will remain at 100% equalization rate, uh, and their tax rate will be $22.78 per thousand dollars of assessed value. That is a 16 cent decrease from the year before. Um, Hamlin and Parma are both going to see their equalization rates drop. Hamlin is gonna go from 93% down to 91%, while Parma is gonna go from 100% down to 97%. So uh, they're going to see increases in their rate. Um, however, it doesn't matter uh, which town you live in, if you have uh, a home valued the same in any one of those towns, you will pay the same tax bill. Um, and that's what the, the equalization rate is meant to do. So if we look at kind of an example, um, for each of those towns, um, if you owned a hundred thousand dollars, and I use that number because it's easy to do the math on it, 
uh, and you lived in the town of Hamlin with an equalization rate of 91%, when you receive your tax bill, you'll see the assessed value at $91,000. Even though the home is valued at 100,000, because the equalization rate's at 91%, the assessed value will only be $91,000. If you take that and divide it by 1,000 and then multiply it by the projected tax rate of $25.03, uh, you get a projected tax bill of $2,278, which represents a $16 decrease from the year before. Similarly, if you look at Parma, uh, if you had that same home valued at $100,000, with an equalization rate of 97%. When you receive your tax bill, uh, you'll see an assessed value of $97,000. If you divide that by $1,000 and then multiply it by the projected tax rate of $23.49, you will pay the same $2,278 tax bill and have that same $16 decrease from the year before. The all other, which represents Clarkson and Greece, um, that same home value at $100,000 that has an equalization rate of 100%, when you receive your tax bill, you will see the assessed value at $100,000. If you divide that by 1,000 and multiply it by the projected tax rate of $22.78, you will pay the same tax bill of $2,278 and the same decrease from the year before of $16 um, per $1,000 of assessed value. So again, it doesn't matter where you live in the district um, or what the equalization rate is. If you have the home that's the same value, you will pay the same tax bill. Uh, and again, this is um, something that over the years, as we've looked at this um, as a district, we've been uh, among the bottom in the county um, for our property taxes. So you know, we've been anywhere from as low as fourth in the county to as high as seventh in the county. Um, this past year, uh, we were at six. We're anticipating, based on the information that we've received from the other districts, that we're going to be projected back down to the fourth lowest in the county uh, overall. So again, we've been very consistent over the 10-year history um, uh, with our tax rates. Also on the proposition this year is the bus purchase proposition. Uh, we are replacing buses that are uh, 10 years old. Uh, they typically have between 100 and 140,000 uh, miles on them. Um, our district uh, does encompass 70 square miles. We're transporting uh, 4,800 students on a daily basis on 360 different bus routes, and we cover 47 schools and programs throughout the county. Uh, and each year, our buses are driven a total of about 1.5 million miles uh, a year. So this year we are looking to spend uh, just over a million dollars. The plan is to replace six of our large buses, uh, 69 passenger buses, two of our 30 passenger buses, and two of our 24 passenger wheelchair accessible buses. Uh, buses are financed over a five year period. Uh, we operate them for 10 years uh, and the first uh, payment will fall in the 2021-22 school year. And uh, over 85% of the cost of the buses will be reimbursed through state aid. All right, so we'll bring you home here in the presentation. So we do have the election of board members. Uh, there are two seats open. Uh, we have two incumbents running for those seats, and Mary Ann Chafee and Brian O'Connor. And we have newcomer Colleen Nowacki. Uh, voting guidelines. So usually this is a, a gloss over. Most everybody understands what the voting guidelines are. Uh, there are some things that are different this year. Uh, you must be a citizen in the United States over the age of 18 and a resident of the school district for 30 days. That stays the same. But voting will take place by absentee ballot. So the district has sent two ballots home to each household. Uh, if people uh, need additional ballots, they can contact our district clerk, uh, Mrs. Norris, to, to have those. And the absentee ballots must be received by five o'clock on June 9th. So that's really important. Um, I know I've canvassed uh, many of our community members and they are, uh, they do have their ballots. Uh, so there is ample time for them to return them and they must be received by the district at five o'clock on June 9th. 
So at this point in time, I want to thank everybody for their patience. There was a lot of information. Um, I want to applaud uh, everyone who's put the work in to develop this budget and open it up for uh, any questions or comments from the board and also anyone viewing today's hearing. I have two questions that have come in uh, for the public hearing. Both are from Michelle Nelson. The first is on the budget presentation slides 9 of 17, there is a summary of one way to cover the budget deficit involving attrition, comma, layoff, comma, other. What would be included in the other category? I can answer that question. So um, the slide that uh, is being referenced is actually from a previous uh, presentation that's on our website, uh, but we had a very similar slide on this presentation. It was on slide 21 uh, and when we were talking about the budget reductions. Uh, the other category uh, is comprised of three different areas. Um, it's comprised of what's called a six uh, period stipend. Uh, so if we have based on enrollment, the need to offer an additional course, instead of hiring uh, somebody to do that, uh, we look to have a teacher pick up an additional section uh, to teach that course. So we're eliminating uh, those as needed and we do that um, pretty much every year based on enrollment. Uh, the other category that falls into other uh, are those part-time employees. These are annual appointments. Again, um, it's not somebody that is a full-time employee of the Hilton School District. Uh, this is a part-time employee where um, we are no longer going to require those services um, for the following school year. And the last is um, a particular uh, position that uh, we are eliminating. However, the person uh, is being moved to a different area of the budget. So uh, they're not um, losing their job. They're just going to a different area uh, within the district. So that's what the other category makes up on that slide. And we have a second question from also from Michelle Nelson. Does the Hilton cost per pupil include all students, including out of district placements, i.e. BOCES? I can answer that question too. It does. Uh, it includes uh, all of the students that we educate, whether it's in district or out of district. So uh, those students that are attending BOCES, either through a MOCO program or through a special education program, those counts are picked up. We do pay for those so that we do include those in the counts. Uh, the information on the per pupil uh, has, is submitted to the Monroe County School Boards Association and each district submits those counts and their budget in order to develop their or determine their per pupil cost. And those are all the questions that I've received from um, our communications email. Uh, at this point, any questions from the Board of Education? I know you've played a large part in the development of this plan. If you had any questions, we'd be happy to answer those. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your support. And uh, we'll move into the next portion of the meeting, uh, President Hilberg. Okay. All right. Moving on, we have the approval of the regular minutes from our last meeting on May the 26th. So moved. Nancy. Second. All right, we have a motion by Nancy, second by Russ. Second by Russ. Any, discuss any discussion of the minutes? Okay, all in favor of approving the minutes. Aye. 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 Okay, thank you, 7-0. All right, moving on to a uh, report of board level committees. Uh, at this point, uh, does any, I'll just, in general, is there anything out there that anybody needs to report on? Uh, most committees have wrapped up. Does anybody for the board have anything they want to comment on about their committee? Okay, then we'll move on to uh, board level activities. Is there any anything to report from either Monroe County School Boards or New York State School Boards Association? Does anybody have anything? All right, uh, we will move on to the consent 
portion of the meeting, which starts at the bottom of page two and goes through uh, page, the bottom of page four. Motion to have approve a, consent. Thank you, Russ. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Second by Tom. Okay. Any discussion on the consent portion of the meeting? All in favor of the consent portion of the agenda? Aye. 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 All right. Okay. That passes 7 0. All right. Uh, we have nothing under uh, new business. So it looks like we can move right on to administrative reports, Dr. Kasark. All right, uh, I'd like to start out as uh, everybody knows uh, what a challenging time it is uh, in our society uh, because of COVID-19 and also uh, because of the racism that is occurring uh, across the nation. And we wanna support our students and families and staff during this trying time. So although that we're apart physically, we wanna to be together to support each other. So uh, once again, our counselors are available uh, throughout the school district uh, for any students or families that uh, may need that extra support. And then also uh, we'll be sending out some, some supports to our staff as well, uh, as we know that these are very trying times. And uh, we continue to, uh, to work on our strategic plan, which includes uh, that social emotional piece and certainly moving the organization and education as far as equity goes, as I mentioned earlier in the budget presentation. I also wanted to congratulate our top 20 and our IB candidates. I uh, really wanna thank Dr. Suresh for her leadership with the IB program. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Ackroyd, uh, all of our teachers uh, who really uh, help those students move along in that very challenging curriculum, uh, but very rewarding curriculum. I also wanna thank Dr. Green uh, for putting together our uh, trip today. I know we all hit our step count on our pedometer. Uh, it was just uh, really great. I wanna thank Julie Norris for uh, her support as well and Grace Sism for joining us uh, to make sure that we could report on and the great things that are happening. And uh, thank you to the board for taking the time to be there. I, I know you experienced firsthand, but the community is very appreciative uh, for the steps that we are uh, taking to make the best out of a, a crummy situation. So thank you very much. Uh, I also want to continue to thank our clerical, our SRPs, our teachers, our administrators uh, for all their efforts uh, as we finish up the school year. Uh, as you know, we have uh, decided on an end date of June 17th for the students and June 18th for the staff. And that is because we did hold school uh, for the spring recess. But it's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of challenge, a lot of stress, a lot of strife. Uh, one of the most challenging things to to deal with in life is change and uh, we're drinking out of a fire hose as far as change goes. So uh, people are really having to uh, move quickly and do the best for students. So once again, I wanna commend all of our uh, staff in the district, uh, including the uh, governance team for all of their uh, work and thoughtfulness to provide a top notch education for our students. Uh, also would like to thank uh, Mr. Massey and everyone uh, who participated in uh, the process for the Merton Williams principalship. Uh, we're fine tuning some things there. Uh, there has not yet been a final decision, but there will be in the very near future. Uh, but one of the great things that was able to happen out of human resources and um, was the ability to include so many more stakeholders voices from students to parents, uh, to many of our staff members as well. So once again, I wanna applaud the work out of the HR office and thank you, Mr. Massey for that. Uh, there is a thought exchange that's out there and will be closing soon uh, for any thoughts and concerns on reopening the district. So clearly we are uh, at this point in stage two of reopening. Education falls in stage four. Uh, the soonest that that would happen would most likely be uh, early July, the end of June. Um, so with that, uh, we do have to submit a plan uh, to a state education department and the governor's office for reopening. So really what we're looking to do at this point in time is to continue remote operation and be prepared since uh, summer school will be remote, be prepared to open our doors in September if uh, we are able to. Uh, Dr. Suresh is working on a plan. We are waiting to hear from um, State Education Department for families who may be interested in opting into a remote learning uh, situation moving forward. 
And we're currently to, uh, putting together the structures for what we're calling a rapid response team. So we know that there are going to be many different uh, changes in the path that we take from now until uh, school starts in September. We know this is a very fluid situation. So we wanna to prepare to have students back. We also wanna prepare uh, having students back in September and maybe having to close in October. Uh, we also wanna prepare for every possible scenario. So I would invite board members, uh, community members, we're going to have representatives from every stakeholder group and we're creating uh, multiple rapid response teams. So for example, one of the rapid response teams may be around social distancing. We may have another around transportation. We may have another around uh, temperature checks. We're going to use a thought exchange uh, software as well. And we're going to create a cycle where these committees meet and brainstorm the best case scenario on what uh, that might look like. Uh, we'll have teacher representatives, SRP representatives, and they'll pitch the ideas uh, to the administration, we'll provide feedback, and we'll continue that cycle until we have buy-in from as many stakeholders as possible and are able to submit a responsible plan that can be approved with the number one priority of keeping our students and staff safe. So in closing, uh, that's what I have for you. Um, one of the updates as well, we know that uh, when the uh, election and uh, also the budget vote takes place, uh, we will be practicing social distancing. Uh, I will be providing an update for you uh, on the outcome. We'll be streaming live for any community member who's interested in watching the count of the vote uh, on the YouTube channel. So if you'd like to tune in, uh, you will be able to watch uh, the election officials along with the district clerk and Mr. Geist uh, count the votes. Uh, we'll also uh, maintain those votes for a paper backup uh, to provide the, the most valid count uh, possible. So uh, once again, those votes do need to be in by 5 p.m. on June 9th. And if the community has not uh, received a ballot and wants one, uh, they need to contact uh, Mrs. Norris as soon as possible, and we'll be able to get to that, that ballot to you as soon as possible as well. So that's what I have for you this evening. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, uh, Dr. Swart. Moving on to Adam. Okay, so we'll start with the April fund balance report. Um, so uh, let me see, I'm going to attempt to share my screen again. And okay, so I, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on this. Um, as you know, you heard in the earlier presentation, we are um, looking to maximize our fund balance this year. Typically, we get to carry over 4% as kind of our rainy day funds um, and, and also move money into reserves. So uh, moving from uh, March to April, the business office in particular, uh, Jeremy Nardone, has provided um, you know, refinements to where we think we're going to land. Uh, we've seen uh, most of the changes take place on the expenditure side, uh, things like reduced costs associated with um, fuel, um, Reduce costs associated with utilities, um, and uh, you know, reduce costs associated with staffing, especially in substitutes, uh, substitute costs. So um, we've projected uh, about an additional nine hundred thousand dollars worth of fund balance that we're going to generate uh, from where we were as of the end of March. Uh, we're going to continue to look at these numbers and refine them. Uh, we, we provide a range, the lowest and the highest. Uh, to, you know, to uh, kind of give the board and the community a sense on what that could look like. And so uh, at this point in time, uh, I'll answer any specific questions uh, related to the fund balance projection. All right, uh, hearing none, I'll move on to the district updates. Uh, so, uh, have a, a lot going on. I'll share some of the highlights. Uh, I'll begin by uh, talking about the food service department. Uh, so uh, John Vesalio from Spice of Life Productions uh, has donated the use of a tent uh, for our food distribution. So that was uh, greatly appreciated. And that's very helpful as the temperatures continue to rise to provide uh, additional shade uh, for the employees that have been uh, serving breakfast and lunch uh, to the students. Uh, at this point in time, since the start of the shutdown, uh, we have served over 65,000 meals uh, to the community. 
So uh, they've been, food service hasn't missed a beat. Uh, they've been working really hard and uh, they've been uh, on uh, the site since uh, Monday the 16th of March. So uh, kudos to them. Uh, Buildings and Grounds Department, we've had a couple updates, uh, mainly around the capital project side of thing. If you've driven by the high school, you've seen the construction that's taken place in the bus loop. Uh, you've seen the um, varsity softball field. Uh, they had the sod that was installed. They have the press box being built, the scoreboards up. Um, so a lot of great things going on uh, with our capital project. Uh, we also uh, had some work that was done over at Northwood outside of the capital project, but uh, we replaced some floor tile that really made uh, the space um, in the main office and the nurse's office um, really, really look good. It was a worn down space and uh, it looks very nice um, after the renovation there. Uh, we have also been looking at uh, and working on the LeBeau Field sound system. Uh, so we um, responded to uh, neighbor complaints that the system was too loud. Um, we also had, believe it or not, some areas uh, inside the stadium that even though it was loud to the neighbors, uh, you couldn't hear it, uh, whether you're in the end zone or on the visitor sideline or if you're at the 50 yard line. Um, so um, we have kind of uh, revamped, worked with a vendor, um, and now we have programmed it. Uh, hopefully this will put the noise issue from the neighbor's side of things behind us and will also improve the sound quality um, in all areas within the stadium, uh, as I mentioned. So uh, we have some final tweaks to make before the start of the uh, fall sports, if we're able to get underway with fall sports um, in order to uh, kind of put that to bed. And then finally, in the area of transportation, uh, we've been um, proceeding with professional development really in all areas, but uh, our bus drivers and attendants uh, have been every week, every day, going through professional development on various topics. Uh, the focus of the office staff has been to build their pool of sub-drivers and attendants. Uh, we, before being shut down, were experiencing um, a shortage in bus drivers, as many districts in the area and in the state and really in the country have experienced. Uh, so they've begun the interview process um, to start building up our reserves for bus drivers. Uh, they've also uh, looked at a plan into reopening uh, for their building. So looking at their common spaces related to uh, the driver's break room and the training room uh, and things of that nature, identifying uh, traffic flow patterns, staggering times uh, for drivers to start again in order to respond to uh, some of the issues that we're dealing with uh, COVID including the cleaning and disinfecting of our school buses um, and putting a process together for that. So they're just starting that work. There's much more to do. Um, and that uh, I'm sure will be one of the topics that we'll be discussing as part of that rapid response team that Dr. Kasorik mentioned. And then lastly, I uh, just again want to reiterate um, uh, the budget vote. Uh, so that is on June 9th. Uh, it is by absentee ballot only. Um, we've uh, included the instructions on how to complete that ballot. Uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to uh, Ms. Norris or myself. Uh, all of the information, including the presentation tonight, uh, will be posted on our website. Um, and so if you have uh, any specific questions regarding the budget, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and I will uh, do my best to answer those questions for you. So that's all I have right now. Thank you, Adam. Uh, next up is uh, Mr. Massey. Scott, I believe you're on mute. Sorry about that. I'll be pretty quick. Uh, most of the work out of HR in the past week, since we just met a week ago, has been on either administering or planning to administer activities affiliated with the hiring of, uh, to fill the position of Merton Williams principal. So uh, um, we're getting close. We feel really good about the candidates um, and we think we'll have someone identified fairly shortly, but uh, that's what most of the work has been other than trying to help a little bit um, with people that are retiring and working on their post-retirement plans and the medical aspects of that 
um, or working with the unions about um, trying to avoid layoffs and helping people uh, find other work. Uh, that's what's occurred in the past week. Any questions? I'll, I'll answer any questions you might have. Thank, Thank you. you, Scott. Thank you. Okay, moving on to Dr. Suresh. Um, much of what I um, have been doing was pretty much a lot of um, what I reported last week with just some nuances. So I'm spending a lot of time meeting with uh, teachers and groups of teachers to talk about next year. As I mentioned, I believe that it's important that everybody's voice is, um, we're able to hear everybody's voice. I also believe that it's not a one and done kind of conversation, that we need to have those conversations and think about them and then come back. So that's why um, the, this is the second week of the three weeks that I'll be doing that. I continue to have the Office of Instruction update meeting. So that's for about 90 minutes. And then the other meetings are an hour meetings. I meet with um, groups as far as grade level bands, like the K2, the 3, 4, then the 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 12, and then art, music, PE, fax, business, tech, and next week is special ed. So it takes up a lot of time, but it's really, um, I think, worth the um, time that it takes, and it's very, very well attended. What we've realized was um, a lot of people were thinking that next year we need to have some consistency with using certain platforms such as everybody using a google platform google, excuse me google classroom as well as making sure that some of our communication to uh, parents and to the other teachers has some sort of consistency in it so i'll be sharing some of those threads of um, ideas that have come about they will help us with planning as we move forward um, next year um, teachers, administrators, teacher assistants, teacher aides, clericals are all invited to come to those. Um, in addition, some of the things that just happened since the last time we spoke, we had a couple of student presentation. Northwood had some TED Talks from their REACH program and Quest had their PYP uh, presentations. Um, in the area of special education, we've completed about 400 to 500 um, annual reviews since we've been out and that's thanks to laura whitcomb and julie forgione so that was a lion that was a lot of work that had to be done there our kindergarten registration is in a very good place we're reaching out to the parents and the families who have not registered their students so um but there's very low numbers with that um we're looking at for next year, we also have to get a better under understanding or how many of our families actually have internet. So we've put together a, um, a procedure and we will be calling all of our families, which is about 3,500 families to have a conversation with each one of them to see if they have uh, internet. This, uh, at 5.30 this evening, I just received some specifics about our BOCI summer school. It will be remote. I've sent that information out to the high school administrators and counselors so that we can prepare for that. I met with the IV coordinators and we're planning on online learning for both middle years program and the diploma program. Because as you know, as I reported previously, the BOCES um, uh, training was, um, had been canceled. And lastly, last, yesterday, I met with a group of parents and stakeholders for our Title I meeting. We're required by Every Student Succeed Act to have a uh, Title I meeting. So we had that yesterday. And then on June 10th at 4 o'clock, I'll have another Zoom meeting with all stakeholders about all of the different uh, title grants that we have. That's about what I have this week. If there's any questions, I'll take those now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Barb. Okay, so moving on to close up the meeting. Uh, upcoming events, don't have anything there as of now, but that's continually fluid. Um, additional agenda <laughs> items for the next meeting on January 23rd will be the approval of the budget vote and election results, the bus bond resolution and the reserve transfer authorization. Does anybody from the board have anything else to add before we wrap up tonight? Um, I do have one question more of a clarification. Can uh, someone speak to 
the the due date for uh, the ballots on June 9th being 5 p.m. That means it needs to be physically at the office, not just uh, postmarked for June 9th. Can that someone clarify that? Yep, uh, that is correct. So it, it needs to be received and in the hand of the district prior to five o'clock, not postmarked. You are accurate. And there will be um, a way to be able to drop it off at district office. Uh, yes, at district office, we will have a drop box uh, for anyone who is uh, concerned or nervous about uh, the response or the speed of the United States Postal Service. Um, but those are first class returns. Uh, but to play it safe, if you're getting close to the deadline, uh, you can drop that off in, at the, to the district uh, yeah, on uh, West Ave. Great. Thank you. Yeah, just to uh, expand on that a little bit, so we will have a ballot box inside the vestibule. You'll be able to be buzzed in. You won't have to touch the door. Somebody will be able to drop it into the, the box. Um, that'll be available from 8 o'clock in, in the morning until um, approximately 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, beginning most likely this Friday. And then on Tuesday, we will be running right up until 5 p.m. in order to drop that off. And then once 5 p.m. comes, we will look at all the ballots. Any ballot that's delivered after that, whether it's through uh, the post office or whether it's through somebody trying to drop it off in person, unfortunately, we will not be able to count that ballot. So it is very important that the ballot is received by the district by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, June 9th. Okay, hey, anybody any, have anything else? All right, I don't see anything else. So just once again, thank you, Casey, Adam, Scott, Barb, for everything that you guys are doing. I, we all appreciate that. Uh, and with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Russ? Second. Second by, second by Tom. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.